the death of a young Englishman named Munro, carried off by a man-eating tiger in 1792, was the inspiration for some of the strangest artefacts in the collections of any museum. Munro was the son of Sir Hector Munro, one of the East India Company's generals. And his death was seen by Tipu, Sultan of Mysore, as divine retribution against the British invaders. He commissioned the famous mechanical toy depicting a tiger mauling its victim, which contained an organ to reproduce the appropriate roars and screams, as well as play a tune. It was certainly a peculiar idea for a palace entertainment, but then Tipu was no ordinary prince. It was Tipu's tenacity, military prowess, and the adoption of the tiger as his personal symbol that earned him the title of the Tiger of Mysore. Tipu's father, Haider Ali, a commander-in-chief, who had usurped the throne of Mysore, began a career of military expansion in South India. Together, father and son involved the British in no less than four wars. Tipu succeeded to the throne in a turbulent era, when the European powers were seeing the rise of revolution, first in America and then in France. Tipu's ambassadors visited the court of Louis XVI and received, among other gifts, this bust of the king. But French power in India was on the wane, and Tipu also sought allies in Turkey, Afghanistan and Iran, and among other Indian rulers. The British East India Company had fielded some impressive generals and administrators, notably Sir Robert Clive and Warren Hastings, who defeated the French and made allies of powerful leaders like the Nizam of Hyderabad. The British for decades, indeed for centuries, had had commercial interests in India. Uh, Tipu was obviously a native ruler and resented the intrusion, A, of a foreign power, and B, what is more, of the infidel, the Christians, and he was a Muslim. And he determined to lay down his life to rid his territories of what he saw as a usurping power. And therefore, I think a conf conflict was indeed inevitable. Well, the main reason that the British uh, gave, as it were, for, the, for their successful conquest was uh, that uh, it, it related to the superiority of their civilization, their, their technology of warfare, uh, their, their statecraft. And Tipu, uh, in a sense, undermined all these myths, not only because he often had the British armies on the run, uh, partly because he was a great modernizer and had very, uh, uh, very competent armies that were, his light cavalry was always capable of harrying, uh, and indeed did uh, harry uh, British troops. Um, and uh, he, for, the, or for all those reasons, became, was, it was the obverse, in a sense, of uh, the way the British presented themselves. In 1780, at a time of shifting alliances, Hyder and Tipu marched against the British with a huge army. Lieutenant Colonel Bailey, with a detachment of 3,000 troops, was cut off en route to join Munro's forces near Madras. The ensuing Battle of Holyloe was a disaster for the British. Hyder and Tipu managed to concentrate their forces, joining those of their French allies under Lally. They had superior numbers, their famous light cavalry, rockets and cannon. The battle, I'm afraid, was uh, one of a number of instances where the British didn't shine in military management and organisation. It's not easy to fight a battle in India when your command may be at Madras and your ultimate command is the company's offices in London. I mean, the question of distance is one thing. Um, but uh, there were very real problems in, in direct lines of command. Hesitation and indecision did cost um, the British, in fact, many points in this battle. Tipu immortalized his triumph at Polilure in a series of painted murals in his palace at Seringapatam. The artist captured wonderfully the moment when a Mysorean shell landed in the British ammunition wagon, to the great consternation of Bailey, languishing in his palanquin, whose expression captures the moment perfectly. Bailey himself was captured after the battle and died in Tipu's jail. But the Sultan's reputation as a cruel despot was probably in part the result of British propaganda. I think Tipu did become uh, a British obsession, uh, partly because Tipu fitted with the ideals of, uh, the company's ideals of, of, of sort of Indian kingship, if you like, uh, that it was also important uh, to present him as a zealot and as, as, as barbarous. Uh, of course, he wasn't always kind 
to the British. I mean, I don't know that he compares particularly badly with some of the things the British did in the pacification, uh, as they called it, of the mutiny, or, or some of the things they did when they took back Delhi, as they uh, would have it. He clearly was uh, militarily ruthless, um, and that necessarily entailed savagery, but I don't think that, that it's particularly helpful to make uh, a moral judgment of that kind. No one would deny that 18th century warfare had its bloody elements and the Polilio murals made frequent references to the gory aspects of battle. Ten years later, when Tipu was defending Seringapatam against an imminent attack from the Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief, Lord Cornwallis, he prudently had the whole mural whitewashed over. But Tipu wasn't merely a warrior. He was also a patron of the arts and a diplomat. This side of his character may be due for reappraisal. Tipu has appeared in many history books um, to do with political and military affairs. He's never been studied in any depth as uh, an inventor and a creator and as an artistic patron, and I think an, a, a reassessment is long overdue. I think that the person who hasn't emerged as um, a character is the Tipu who built gun roads across his territories focusing on Mysore, who introduced silk to Mysore, and that's now one of India's main exports, who built a great dam to control the River Calvary on a spot where, about 200 years later, the Indians themselves decided it would be a very good idea to build a dam, and in fact found Tipu's foundation stone when they themselves started their excavations. I think the side of Tipu that hasn't been studied until very recently is the Tipu who had an enormous library of all sorts of volumes, many of which survive. The Tipu who decorated all his objects with his motif of the tiger or the bubri, which is the stylized tiger stripe. And the inventiveness and the ingenuity with which he implied these motifs to everything that he possessed. And I think the light motif of the tiger and the tiger stripe is something that is, well, is one of the most exciting aspects of Tipu yet to be fully appreciated. The tiger was ubiquitous. Within the walls of his island capital of Seringapatam, Tipu built the great mosque with its twin minarets and the magnificent Darya Dalat Bagh, or garden palace of the wealth of the sea. In his Lal Bagh palace, he set his tiger throne, monumental by European standards, made of heavy wood and entirely covered in the purest sheet gold. Magnificent hangings embroidered with gold glistened with tiger stripes. Illustrations show Tipu enthroned, but the Sultan, it is said, vowed never to mount it until he had expelled the British from India. And so he never did. The city was a sight to wonder at, with its palaces, mosques and minarets, and its Hindu temples. One of the grandest buildings, with an impressive bulbous dome, is the tomb Tipu built for his father, Hyder Ali. It's now possible to reconstruct something of the exotic magnificence of Tipu's court. Here he is pictured outside the Lalbagh palace with his elephants, which were taught to kneel before him. The elephant saddles varied from the relatively plain to the most sumptuous embroidered objects. And of course, Tipu and Haider, on state occasions, would have traveled in howdahs almost big enough to double as bandstands. Tipu rose early, donning a fine white Muslim gown or jama, and in the lining of his drawers, he had a pocket in which he kept a European watch. This, like his cane and so many other personal effects, was among the objects found when Seringapatam finally fell. Of several portraits of Tipu, that by George Cherry, secretary to Cornwallis, is the most famous. It shows him a little corpulent, heavily bejeweled, and wearing the broad flat turban which he generally favoured. Tipu devoted a good deal of his day to affairs of state. Indeed, it would have been impossible to sustain his ambitious progress, whether military or civil, unless he'd been a capable and popular ruler. They handled their economy very well. Uh, Cornwallis, uh, a new friend of Tipu's, said that Tipu's Mysore was a garden from end to end. Uh, and Mysore was indeed very prosperous uh, under Hyder and Tipu. A favorite pastime was hunting. Tipu maintained a stable of highly trained hunting cheetahs, three of which, with six trainers, traveling cart, and two bullocks, were sent to George III after Tipu's death.